Okay, so hello everyone and welcome. You are dialed into FIT's online event, Post-Pandemic Globalization. I'm your host, Caroline Tompkins, President and CEO of FIT. Before we get started, I have been tasked with providing a few housekeeping items. We are recording this event and we'll send you the full recording in the coming days so you can review it at your leisure. Throughout the presentation, you can post questions to the panel at any time by adding them to the comment bubble on the bottom toolbar. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the event and we'll answer as many as we can during the live Q&A session. Today's event covers an important topic, globalization in current times and moving into a post-pandemic world. I'm very excited to have with us today our speaker, Stephen Pullis. While Steve will be formally introduced in a couple of minutes, I did want to mention that Steve and I met probably about 20 years ago. And to this day, he continues to be a strong supporter and ambassador of FITS. I'm not sure if I've mentioned it to you before, Steve, but I quote you on a regular basis as recently as yesterday, in fact. The quote taken from the foreword you provided for one of FITS research projects about seven years ago goes like this. Trade happens between people, not between countries. It doesn't matter how good the trade agreements are or how good the intercountry relationships are or how attractive one country's goods and services may be to the people in another country. Without trade capable people, trade will not flourish. This resonates with me because this is what FIT is all about, looking at globalization from the human resource lens by creating and recognizing trade capable people, individuals who are able to support the way their companies invest, grow and compete in global markets. So thank you for that quote. Our panel moderator, Alberto Queros, has a long history of FIT as well. We met about 20 years ago and have remained friends and colleagues ever since. Alberto's passion for international trade combined with his acute business sense, sense made him a natural candidate for the FIT board. It was obvious in the early days on the FIT board that he had the leadership qualities one needs to support growth, the growth of a not-for-profit organization like FIT. Always well prepared, he asks pointed and relevant questions, provides his insights and uses sound judgment when addressing issues or decisions at the executive board level. This along with his personal experience of taking FitSkills courses and ultimately becoming a CITP, a certified international trade professional, combined with his vision and leadership expertise made him an obvious candidate for the role of the FIT board chair. Alberto also has a day job. He runs Intellimeter Canada Inc. as its president and owner. Intellimeter services North America in the energy information sector. Alberto's work experience in more than 30 countries combined with his fluency in English, Spanish and French complement his international trade expertise. Alberto, thank you and I pass the mic over to you. Yes, thank you for that wonderful introduction and for the reminder. Uh, I'd have to add that I'm very grateful for FIT. Uh, when I came to Canada as an engineer, uh, I didn't have Canadian experience and I could only find a job in sales. And it was sales exporting electrical equipment to South America. And not knowing then how to provide credit or collect from someone as far as way as Chile or not knowing how to ship equipment to a mine in the Andes, I went to school and I took the FIT courses and follow by that, I obtained my certification as an international trade professional. This opened many doors, and I'd say thanks to FIT skills, I had a very successful career. Uh, now to our speaker. I'm truly excited to introduce CITP Stephen Polos, who is a special advisor at Osler, Hoskin, and Harcourt LLP. He's a former governor of the Bank of Canada. Stephen is a widely recognized economist with nearly 40 years of experience in financial markets, forecasting and economic policy. Uh, prior to joining Osler, Stephen was the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada, Canada's central bank for seven years. Prior to joining the bank, Stephen spent 14 years at Export Development Canada, EDC. He was there the chief economist, head of lending, and finally, the president and CEO. He also spent four years at BCA Research, where he was managing editor of the International Bank Credit Analyst, 
one of their fla flagship publications. At Osler, Hoskin and Harcourt, Steve provides clients with significant expertise, strategic guidance regarding financial system, trade and economic policy, both domestically and on a global scale. Stephen is also a CITP, a Certified International Trade Professional, which is a prestigious industry-backed designation built on competency standards set by FED. The designation stands as a symbol of both competency and credibility for global business professionals. Being awarded the designation proves a thorough grasp of international trade, international trade processes, and a commitment to global trade a dedication to ethical business practices and ongoing professional development. This gives your clients, employers, and colleagues added confidence in your global skills and knowledge. Stephen is also a graduate of Columbia University Senior Executive Program, and he has been a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, DC, and at the Economic Planning Agency in Tokyo, Japan. He is a frequent speaker and a writer and has taught economics at the University of Western Ontario, Concordia University and Queens School of Business. The Stevens new book, The Next Age of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future is also now available for pre-order. Some of the points touched upon today are discussed in this book and we will get to hear more once we get into the presentation itself. Welcome, Stephen. Well, thank you very much, Alberto. It's a very kind, uh, a very thorough introduction. That's, uh, that's, that's a lot. I must be a pretty old guy for all that to be true. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. And I, I do wish we could be in the same room like we used to do regularly. You know, having retired uh, about a year ago, you can imagine I have a lot of mementos uh, collected over the years. And one of my favorites is the uh, the blue one you can see uh, over my over my shoulder there. That's uh, the original CITP cartoon uh, piece of artwork there. The person is being interviewed uh, by the head of HR. And uh, so anyway, the person being interviewed says, no, 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 no. When I wrote CITP after my name, I meant charming, industrious, trainable, promotable. Well, okay, that cartoon was dated 2013. Caroline gave that to me, uh, well, I guess when it was just when I was done at EDC. And the organization uh, FIT has come a long way since, since uh, we first met Caroline, and you should be very proud of it. Uh, I see the CITP proudly displayed all over LinkedIn, for example, everywhere I go. Well, the topic du jour is still the pandemic, just as it has been for nearly 18 months now. Uh, but today I want to look further out, uh, look into the crystal ball, and yes, actually I do have a real one, a real crystal ball right here. People think that's a joke, that economists don't have crystal balls, but I do have a crystal ball, and that's, that's what they look like. And it's usually done a pretty good job for me. Uh, so what I want to do is talk about what the post-pandemic world has in store for us, especially on the trade front. Now there's no doubt that the pandemic has shaken our foundations, it will have permanent effects on the global economy and on how we do business. But much of what I have to say today was in motion long before COVID-19 came along. Well, the pandemic might have accelerated some of those things, but they were already there and they were, they were destined to affect our future. The, the pandemic is first and foremost a medical disaster. The most important effect is not economics per se, it's in the lives that have been lost, uh, we're around 175 million cases now around the world, and we're approaching 4 million deaths, which of course is dreadful. Um, but again, a little bit of history, you should never lose your perspective. 100 years ago, the Spanish flu killed at least 20 million people, some say as many as 50 million people. And at that time, there were only about well under 2 billion people in the world. Uh, so that was, uh, that was true, truly catastrophic. But the point is that today we're doing a better job, at least medically. Now, there was a lot of talk a year ago about what the pandemic would do to our economies. 
And once they got engaged, economists went into sort of a competition to see who could have the gloomiest forecast. Now, I think the strongest headline that I saw last year was that this will be the worst recession since the Great Depression. Now, that's saying something, that's for sure. The Great Depression was a recession that lasted for 10 years and output fell by cumulatively 30%. Wow, can you imagine if we were living in something that's worse than that? Well, the experience under COVID has varied quite a bit from one country to another, but just to illustrate with Canada, here in Canada, the economy did shrink by about 20% back in last April, May, which is a pretty big number, but it's not maybe as big as I might've thought. You know, if you shut down the whole economy, did you expect that when you shut the whole economy down, still around 80% would just keep running? That surprised me a little. But the declines in the economy here in Canada lasted only two months. The economy began to grow again uh, in June last year. And by the fall, we were operating at 97% of pre-pandemic levels of economic activity. And right now we're 98 to 99% of pre-pandemic levels. Now, you wouldn't know that probably by watching the news. Uh, we're hearing, hearing mostly about the sectors that have been hit directly by COVID, the shutdown sectors. And our media live uh, there uh, in, in that part of the economy all day and all, all night. But the key to this is that each time we have closed the economy, the unaffected sectors have continued to do well. There's been no spread of the negative sentiment from the directly affected sectors to the rest of the economy. And this is exactly why those comparisons last year to the Great Depression were so inappropriate and actually totally misleading. Now, a recession happens when your next door neighbor loses their job and they cut their spending. But when you hear about it, you cut your spending too, because you worry that you might be the next one to lose your job. Well, not in this case. Uh, we had very fast policy responses, monetary policy, and especially fiscal policy. And not to mention the fact that our banks allowed people to take holidays from paying their mortgages. These were really big buffering actions. And it enabled that, that uh, the, the, it was almost as though we stopped the clock in certain sectors and the rest of the economy continued to run. Now, this is exactly why economists have been pretty uniformly surprised each stage of the recovery. The global economy has shown a lot of resilience, not just in Canada, all around the world, a lot more resilience than economists figured on. And the reason is that they're, they're modeling this as a conventional recession and it simply is not. A COVID, I think, is much more like a natural disaster than a typical recession. Uh, I'm reminded of how people reacted to 9-11, which is now over 20 years ago. Economists predicted a long global recession after 9-11, and instead, what did we have? We had a boom in the global economy. I'm also reminded of the Spanish flu 100 years ago, as I mentioned before, it was drastic. It was just absolutely tragic for the world. Well, economists were predicting that there would be a depression after the Spanish flu. Instead, what did we have? We had the roaring 20s. So I find myself in that place again. I mean, I'm expecting the rollout of vaccines to unleash a COVID relief boom based on pent-up demand from households. I'm not expecting the roaring 20s again. Pent-up demand is for services. Like you can't go out after the, after the restrictions are lifted and go out and have six haircuts in one week to catch up. That's not the way it will work. Uh, people, uh, people already bought a lot of things for their house. The pent up demand is for services like restaurants, bars, especially travel. Uh, you only do so much of that. In-person retail will probably really boom because clothes, you know, people haven't bought a lot of clothes or shoes over the past year. But for the home, they've overbought that stuff. Renovations and things for their house, feathering your nest, which is exactly what people did after 9-11. Now, there'll also be some permanent effects on the economy. Work arrangements are gonna change for sure. Uh, I have no idea really how it'll all turn out, but I can guarantee you there's gonna be less commuting 
and therefore less less few people on any given day fewer people will be downtown possibly as little as half as there are as there were pre-covid there will be less business travel why why now that we've perfected using zoom and everything why would you go every week over to london to negotiate something when you can do it on zoom and maybe just go at the end for a trip to celebrate it uh, there's going to be more people living in the suburbs. We know this because they because they can. That means maybe more two car families because everybody knows if you live in the suburbs like I do, you can't get anywhere on a bus except downtown. And then there's trade. The crisis has for sure created some geopolitical tensions and some questions around the future of trade. And that's where I want to turn my attention now. Now we all know that there were trade tensions long before COVID-19 came along. So let's take a moment and think about what was causing that. Well, at this point, many people sum it up in two words, Donald Trump. You know, the Trump administration was using trade as a, as, as a bargaining chip uh, throughout its tenure. So fair enough. But then when I ask, well, where did that come from? Now, not just the Trump administration, but other administrations around the world, more populist in their leaning, I think have tapped into a wave of discontent in, in the middle class. It's particularly noticeable middle class America. Uh, but it's not alone. I mean, Boris Johnson arguably was elected by, by the similar kind of tapping into the similar kind of vein. And there is a, you know, a more, more of a populist uh, bent in European politics as well. And of course, there's lots of emerging markets where this is true. And the source of this discontent, I think the most important is rising income inequality. Now data from the UN show very clearly that income inequality has risen for over 70% of the world's population over the past 30 years. Now the reasons for this vary from country to country, but the common denominators are technological progress, rising corporate concentration, eroding labor bargaining power, and of course, globalization. And all these things actually tend to go together. Now there's a lot of research on this question. And as an economist, I'd love to dig into it, uh, but let me just spare you the detail. To me, it's quite clear that the root cause is actually technological progress. Technological change has been a constant throughout human history, as we know. Uh, from the very beginning. But it's been punctuated by three major ways of change, and we call those industrial revolutions. These were the steam engine during the 1800s, the spread of electrification in the early 1900s, and the deployment of the computer chip beginning in the late 1970s. Now, each of these technological leaps has delivered untold benefits to society in terms of quality of life, productivity, and of course, income. But at the same time, companies have had to adapt to new technology or be forced out of business. That's highly disruptive. Now, these disruptions are particularly hard on people, on employees. Many of them lost their jobs permanently. Even though many new jobs were being created in the background, you might have lost yours. Now, the first industrial revolution uh, during the mid-1800s was followed by the Victorian Depression of 1873 to 96. The second industrial revolution of the early 1900s was followed by the Great Depression of the 1930s. The third industrial revolution of the 1980s was managed better by policymakers, but there still was considerable disruption and pain. Rather than depressions in the early 1990s and again in the early 2000s, what we saw were, we called them jobless recoveries. That's periods where economic growth recovered from recessions, but not many new jobs were being created. So people were permanently disrupted. And a key feature of all three industrial revolutions is that the economic benefits of the new technology do not get spread around. You might imagine it being spread around like yeast, you know, getting into every crack, uh, and so everybody gets some, but instead the benefits to technology, technological uh, progress tend to pop up more like mushrooms. So not yeast, mushrooms. And then the mushrooms get collected by a few large firms and firms get bigger as a result. So historically, technological change has also always been associated with rising income inequality 
and worker discontent. And of course, opportunistic politicians are tapping into this discontent. Now notice that the peak period of adjustment to the third industrial revolution also corresponds to the peak in the globalization wave that followed China's entry into the WTO. So during the past generation, we've got these two major forces that are helping to contribute to rising income inequality. Now politicians, it seems, prefer to point to globalization as the main reason for rising income inequality. Maybe it's easier to identify. Displaced workers can certainly identify that there's foreign competition perhaps that has, has caused their displacement. And of course, it's deceptively easy to fix. You just impose tariffs to protect people from the disruptions. Well, let's just take a moment to walk through the full impact of a technological leap. Now, firms deploy the new technology. Of course, as we know, people lose their jobs because of that new technology, and the companies make a bigger profit. New jobs in the new technology, they make good money too. Income inequality rises, absolutely it does because many people are disrupted and don't have work at all. But now two things happen. Prices fall. Prices of all the things that use the new technology fall because the companies are more efficient. So purchasing power of people with incomes rises significantly. And the people who are making big money from the innovation spend their purchasing power too. So those two channels of spending create jobs across the entire economy. That's people who don't just make, let's say, I don't know, cars, let's say, but people who build houses, people who are like plumbers or electricians or furnace repair people, all these kinds of jobs that are created because the level of income throughout the economy uh, goes up. That creates new jobs in the economy that no one, and I mean no one, points to as a benefit of technological progress, okay? Now, I know that this audience does not really need reminding of the benefits of trade or globalization, but you could ask exactly the same question about the full and complete effects of globalization. The story is exactly the same as it is for technological progress. Firms make money, prices fall, purchasing power rises, jobs are created that no one, and again, no one points to as a benefit from globalization. So this basic confusion is what I think is driving political polarization around the world and causing politicians more often to intervene in trade. And it's important that we understand the third industrial revolution really well. And that's because we're now just entering the fourth industrial revolution, and that's the digitization of all parts of the economy. AI, bioengineering, amazing leaps in technology. COVID-19 is for sure accelerating the adoption of new technology in all kinds of dimensions. This points to a continued, what I call K-shaped economy, the K-shaped stress for the economy in the years ahead. In other words, people who are being disrupted go to the bottom part of the K, the rest of the economy grows well in the top part of the K. When we look at the economy as a whole, it may look more or less normal, but beneath the surface, there's a lot of pain in some areas and of course, lots of joy in others. So my contention is that we're headed for continued increases in income inequality because of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, this, this is gonna become highly political and therefore increase political polarization and the inability given that polarization, the inability for governments to really forge consensus around the policies that would actually address inequality. That would be major tax reforms, as I'm sure you're aware. It's going to lead to more invention, intervention in the global trading system as a sort of second best and I think generally counterproductive way to manage political risks from those discontent, discontented individuals. And it's going to lead to haphazard trade policies that will fuel geopolitical tensions because every trade policy that you put in place in one country affects another country. And that makes the global trading system inherently unpredictable and riskier overall. With the root cause, this rising income inequality that's coming from that technological wave. Now the question is, how will trade dependent companies, whether they happen to be individual suppliers 
or whether they happen to be managing complex global supply chains, how will they all adapt to what I'm describing, which is an even riskier trade environment? Well, higher risk in general means devoting more resources to active risk management. It means more frequent use of scenario planning, uh, updating those scenarios frequently, not just once a year to, to prove to the board that you're on top of your risk, but rather to develop every time the starting point is changing to do a whole new set of scenarios, uh, have it all automated so that you can keep them up to date. It means the company needs dedicated resources to risk management. A firm that does a good job with risk management will create more shareholder value than one that does not. So to me, risk management is like a new form of intangible investment, like the way companies invest in their brands or the way they invest in their employees. It just, it's a cost item. It doesn't look like equipment or a real investment, but it, believe me, it is because it pays off year after year. So what, the, what will companies do in practical terms? Well, it's a few options, and I always want to run through them, even though maybe one or two of them are just straw men. The first option is, well, avoid it all. You can reshore everything. You can deglobalize the company. Now, this is seen by many as the ultimate form of de-risking. And, and the governments who are, who are advocating for, uh, for disruptions to international trade love it because it seems that it would create local jobs. For example, creating a lot more local jobs building, well, for example, household appliances. Well, the, the tariffs that the U.S. Uh, put in place to try and encourage reshoring of household appliance manufacturing added pretty close to $1,000 per year onto the, onto the cost of every American household. Now, this is money that was no longer available to spend on other things, you know, including things like, let's say, upgrading their kitchen. Now, there are lots of lost jobs, therefore, in the construction sector because people no longer had the resources they would like to have to do a, put a deck on their house or something like this. So those jobs that are lost in the construction sector will not be identified as a side effect of a policy designed to reshore the manufacturing of appliances into the United States. No one will believe the connection, but I know this audience does. This audience is familiar with those trade effects. But besides that, domestic political risk is clearly not zero. Uh, the politicians prove that daily. Polarization makes that risk high. So what's happening is the strategy of reshoring, all it really does is exchange one type of risk for another, possibly a more familiar form. But just because you have all your production in domestic territory doesn't mean suddenly you're risk-free. Okay? So it's important to realize there are, there are nuanced trade-offs there. But the second option that companies might consider is full automation. So given higher domestic wages, partial automation is always part of reshoring. Okay, so you re-optimize, you bring stuff on shore, wage costs are higher, so you figure out what's the appropriate capital labor ratio. And of course, you buy a few robots to complement the people who are on the line. The point is that you may not create as many jobs as the politicians were hoping you would. With a full risk management strategy, you may be able to make the plant full or robots and a handful of technology exports. You could just have all robots and just a few folks running, running the system with a mouse. Uh, this is the ultimate backfire for the politician. So there is always a risk that something else will change after that optimization happens. So the full automation option, it's just I'm doing it for completeness. I don't think it's the way to go, but I do think that to the, to the extent that reshoring is forced by government policies, one of the downsides for the, for the strategy is there will be lots of automation that happens in the process. And so fewer jobs will be created domestically than originally imagined. Well, the third option, which is starting to sound more appropriate, is to keep the supply chains as they are, but manage the risk differently. So you preserve the value that's being created in the global value chain but perhaps give some of it back in order to manage the risk. Globalization has always been portrayed as just black or white. You know, either you're globalized or you're not globalized. Uh, either you're doing trade or you're not doing trade. 
Well, a supply chain was always going to be fluid and, and a living thing and re-optimized often. An optimal global supply chain requires full product fragmentation. Each, each fragment of the process matched with exactly the right skill set and the wage cost in some other country. So when relative wages change, the optimal suppliers of some fragments will change. And therefore, the supply chain needs to be continuously revised as we go through time. So what we need to think of is trade risk or geopolitical risk, call it what you want, is just one more cost or thing that can change that forces a company to re-optimize that global supply chain. So re-optimizing the supply chain more often or more continuously, that's of course going to cost money, but it's a form of insurance against the risks that we're talking about. Re-optimizing the supply chain can be thinking of as right shoring or best shoring, if you like. So examples, uh, practical examples, would be um, create redundancies to reduce risk. So if you have, to, you have one fragment of the process reliant on one supplier, well, find a second supplier and run the system with two suppliers in two different countries for exactly that same fragment. That's just a risk mitigation strategy. It might cost a little bit, but that's a, that's a small price to pay in exchange for, for having a place you can go when something goes wrong because of geopolitical tensions at the top. Secondly, build flexibility into contracts with suppliers from the beginning so that you're not committed for a long time. So that the continuous scenario analysis or business continuity planning allows the movement from one supplier to another. And the third sort of thing that we hear about is nearshoring. That's exploiting nearby trade agreements that offer legal, legal protections for the firm. So for Canadians, for example, you know, uh, using Mexico as a supplier instead of a producer out in, out in Asia somewhere, uh, maybe gives you more protection just because of, uh, uh, because of USMCA, or I prefer to call it, still, I still call it NAFTA. Sorry about that. I'm, I am old fashioned. So, and a fourth option though, uh, is going, going beyond all this, is something which we're seeing more of now, which is we're seeing a bit of a return to vertical integration of firms. Now, vertical integration was all the rage back in the 1970s uh, and early 1980s, uh, back when I was a student. Uh, but you'd buy your suppliers and integrate them into the company so that you internalized all the synergies. Well, look, what happened with globalization was exactly the opposite. Companies specialized as much as possible inside their four walls and spread their production across as many players as they could to get this optimized uh, matching between fragments and the cost structures. And that would maximize value creation. But as we're seeing in this world, it does add some risks uh, to the mix. Digitalization and the cloud uh, open up new and different possibilities. A new re-optimization of that structure, I think for some companies is making increased vertical integration make more sense than it did a few years ago. So it's important to take that analysis to the value chain level rather than thinking of it as just a supply chain. Where is the value being created? Are the matches appropriate? And I know I'm making it sound like a big math problem. It's actually, it's a problem with, of, of uh, kind of trial and error and thinking through the possibilities and running scenarios with, with different arrangements. So this is kind of vertical integration could be both upstream suppliers as I've described here, or it can also be downstream, which is going around distribution, maintenance or other complementary businesses. Um, the point is that adapting to a riskier world will vary a lot from one company to another. And technology is offering a wider set of possibilities. So even if it is a negative event that forces a company to re-optimize, it's possible to have a stronger value chain after you, after you change it. And it's important to remember also that risk, you know, when we say the word risk, it sounds like a bad thing, right? Um, but you have to remember that risk is two-sided. We think of risk as a negative because we don't like the uncertainty that comes with risk. But increased, increased risk means that on any given day, we could have bad luck or we could have good luck. 
Now, therefore, being prepared for risk means not just preparing for the downside or protecting yourself. It means having dry powder so that you can capitalize on a positive outcome. Now, what about governments? Well, you can probably tell that I'm not optimistic about governments in general ability to deliver coherent frameworks in this situation. There are too many other variables that enter, and of course, politics being the art of the possible, uh, not the optimal. Now, in theory, they should be negotiating lots of free trade agreements, or at least investment protection agreements and dispute mechanism agreements with all takers. Personally, I'd be totally happy if the government were to post the USMCA on the Canada website and invite any country that wanted to, to sign up to it with no negotiations. This would create many more options for production in third countries. But I think in the meantime, it's gonna be up to companies to manage the risks that they are dealt. So let me wrap up. I'm actually quite optimistic about the post-pandemic world. Uh, but I want to acknowledge that it's likely to be more volatile and riskier than we got used to in the past. A key source of that uncertainty will be politics, but that's going to be driven by economic fundamentals, which is rising income inequality, which in turn is connected to the technological disruption. The fourth industrial revolution is just getting underway. And that political uncertainty is guaranteed to impinge on the global trading system and affect our business. Risk management, therefore, will become a core competency for all companies, a destination for intangible investment that, uh, that will become of growing importance. Now, we've all managed risk before. In fact, many of you do it every day. Uh, we'll continue to do so, and it's reasonable to expect that we will do just fine. Of course, that's going to take a little hard work and ingenuity. Well, thanks so much for being here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Steve. This is, uh, uh, you provide great, uh, great insights for all of us to, uh, okay. It, you provide great insights into, into what we all need to know, particularly uh, international traders. And I think you have the, 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 right, the right audience. Uh, one of the things uh, you mentioned is, is the political, the political world, and the politicians trying to protect uh, jobs. Uh, one question I would have is: As Canadians, you probably are aware that three quarters of our trade happen with our neighbor in the south, and for our imports and a lot of things that we bring into this country, particularly manufactured goods, come from a from, from a single country, China. And, and we're kind of caught in between the fight between these this two giants. Uh, when, when we think about the majority of companies in Canada, they're medium and small size companies. What recommendations would you give them to address this, this massive risk and to not depend on one, on, on one country for our sales and not depending on another country for for our purchases. Well, uh, of course. Uh, well, why don't we Why don't we move on to the next question, Alberto? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, but anyway, this, this of course is the question that's on everybody's minds, and I take I take a certain amount of heart from something Caroline mentioned at the beginning, uh, which is something I said, I guess, a long time ago, and I still believe it. That when I talk to companies, what I discover is that. Trade is not between Canada and China or Canada and the United States. It's actually between people. And it's people that know one another, have gotten to know with, on one another over the years, and actually have a level of trust with one another. Now, that's not to say that that relationship can't be disrupted by the kinds of things I'm talking about. It, of course it can. Uh, but there's, there, are, there are ways to, to manage the risk person to person that sound easier than they sound when you look at it from the highest level. And I, I, think, I think that uh, we, are, we are in a phase, and I, again, I think the root of this is pretty clear, rising income inequality in the United States is leading to political pressure, which is anti-globalization. I think it's misleading that it's prim primarily about technological change and no one wants to resist that. Right, that's where that's where all the productivity and growth and incomes is going to come from, and so it's a kind of an easy easy target to say let's blame it on China, 
and we can find plenty of reasons to be have to be to be rivals with China instead of partners, and that's that's a concern for me too. Uh, but I think that when you get down to actually thinking about it, we understand when we get into the beyond the political rhetoric, the companies show up and they get consulted and the companies say, well, you know, as a matter of fact, we rely on China for this, that and the other thing. And that's an important reliance and it's good for both of us. Can't we find a way? And so politics being the art of the possible, again, what happens is something that's more compromise like. And um, I, am, I am concerned about it as you are, but in the end, I think mother nature dictates many of these outcomes. I mean, mother nature ar ar arranged all these trade linkages. Uh, it, is, it is the way the way the growth happens, the way companies want to organize themselves. And we know that the options I, outlaid, I laid out, sorry, uh, of 100% reshoring would be a disaster. It would be terrible for incomes, um, you know, no one would believe it, perhaps a priori, but they would find out ex post that, you know, the, the, a lot of jobs will be lost by doing that. Uh, and so that needs to be explained again to people like it did have explained 30 years ago, right? And so uh, all of us on this call are, are advocates or experts. When you're at the barbecue after COVID and you're at somebody's barbecue, uh, you know, somebody's going to say, what's, what's going to go on with China? Well, you're the trade expert. You remind them that, uh, you know, they're the job of the furnace repair person depends on trade with China. They don't realize it, but it, it surely does. And uh, the more people understand how, how profound these linkages are, ask them, are they going to start doing their own dry cleaning? Are we going to grow all our own food? You know, no. Trade is what makes the world go round, always has been, hundreds of years. And so we need to re relearn some of these lessons. And we may have to do a period of negative. We may, we may have some trade restrictions and blow up some supply chains to prove that it's counterproductive. Possibly. I hope not. Well, I certainly hope not. Uh, many of our audience members have submitted excellent questions. And uh, I'll ask Caroline uh, if we can start it with the uh, question and answer portion of the event. Sure, thank you. Um, so question, Steve, from Hussam. What will be the impact of cryptocurrencies and or the digital currencies on the growth of trade? Uh, well, any, uh, any, anything that speeds up payments, uh, I think is a good tool that's, uh, that's it's, you know, like it may be, Maybe this is going to uh, reduce the needs for a letter of credit, or it could reduce the need for insurance if it speeds things up, or maybe your insurance can be for a shorter time frame. There's a lot of things that that faster payments uh, can do for us, and uh, there's no point in resisting them. This is progress. You know, it is it's it's costly from the, in the traditional system to do cross border payments, as, as you know. You know the simple thing, like uh, the, the, the 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 digital currency that uh, Facebook was proposing, called Libra, and now Diem. One of the one of the simple things that it would do is allow you to transfer money to somebody really quickly using the Facebook platform, which actually takes a week and costs a lot of money uh, through the traditional banking system. So so let's let's note that those those are progress. Those are progressive things. They're positives. Uh, well, you mentioned cryptocurrency, which is kind of a separate thing. I don't really think of it as currency at all. Uh, it's more like a speculative asset, an asset with zero intrinsic value, which kind of puts me off a little bit, to be honest. Um, and if, I, if, if people are buying those things as a, a hedge against inflation, I'd go with things like real estate and gold, which have proved for centuries that they protect you against inflation. Um, so uh, I think it's more uh, more a bit of a gamble to be playing around with things like Bitcoin, frankly. Okay, thank you. Um, not sure the author of this question, but uh, mm. fabulous presentation and tie. The question is, what do you think about the rise on environmental, social, and corporate government governance uh, (ESG)? Will this concept and its greater adoption be help to shift uh, wage inequalities? Well, uh, it, it, it probably will. So uh, 
but you know, the mechanism is like this. Like, so ESG, a lot of people think of ESG as, you know, an approaching avalanche of regulation, you know, that we're going to have rules about, uh, for example, net zero emissions by 2050. Okay, so that sounds like a long time from now, but then you're going to have to show how much progress you make every year between now and 2050. Those kinds of frameworks are, that's, that's a fairly uh, concrete part of ESG, right? Uh, G is about diversity and having the right, the right reporting and the boards, boards of a diverse membership and all that kind of thing. Well, where, and, and then the yes, the yes is more about the, the, the rest of the stakeholders, the employees and so on and the communities. And so uh, where does the pressure actually going to come from? It's not going to come from governments, I think. It's going to come from investors. The investor enforcement mechanism is already quite active and it will become increasingly so. So if, you know, the, if today's investor says to their, their portfolio manager, make sure my portfolio is consistent with the Paris Accord or, you know, that's shorthand for, you know, net zero. Uh, then they're only going to select certain companies to have in your in your uh, portfolio, or in the, or in an indexed fund or something like this. And so companies that aren't doing the job are going to get excluded. All right, and the cost of capital will rise for those companies. So those companies, therefore, will need to adapt to a different paradigm, put more investment into ESG to impress the investors, so that the investors then say, okay, include them in my portfolio now because they're doing it right and their cost of capital will fall back down to normal. Well, you can see how that works. It's a pretty powerful mechanism. And that I think is gonna broaden out through time to include things that are more employee centric. Because I think one of the things we're facing is an aging population, an aging workforce, the shrinking, you know, right now, every, every bit of growth that we get in Canada's workforce is coming from immigration, okay? Uh, we could grow it some more if the daycare, national daycare program gets into place, you get a, a surge of women re-entering the workforce. That would be a big positive bump to labor force participation. And that's important ingredient to growth. But right now, it's almost all immigration. Well, okay, uh, we understand that. But that just means in the background that it's getting harder and harder to compete for workers because they were aging workforce and the supply. So I think over time, it's going to become a matter of shareholders saying, are you treating the workers right? Because that's important to the value creation that the firm is creating. And so uh, I think that's where the, the S kind of comes in as, a, as another area where firms will invest more. So, uh, you know, what does it mean we fix inequality? I, I don't really know. I mean, I think there's a sense people think that inequality is an important driver of innovation. That's why firms like want the mushrooms I talked about, right? That's why they do it. They invest all their money and they do things in their garage and they, they create new things. And it's the inequality that makes it worth their while. So the easiest way for society to deal with this is to do more income redistribution afterwards. And that's what, you know, President Biden is trying to do with changing the tax structure. And so it's possible that there'll be, you know, more unionization or, you know, companies like Walmart bumped up their wages above the minimum wage all by themselves, right? Uh, Amazon and those kinds of places. So it's hard to say, uh, but I, I would, I have to believe that uh, somehow or other income, e income distribution is going to have to improve uh, because we're seeing the political implications of ignoring it for some years. Great, thank you, Steve. That uh, question was from our friend and colleague, uh, Audrey Ross. Um, related to the previous question, a uh, question from Ayman is, uh, can, circular, can a circular economy play more of a vital role in the post-pandemic world as an alternative to a regular economy, to the regular economy? Well, sure it can. Uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily connect it to the pandemic. Uh, I mean, there's certain things that the pandemic has set in motion or speeded up perhaps technology deployment and so on but it's 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 more about uh seeing the the benefits uh, of a circular economy in certain dimensions of the economy and uh a pandemic or no pandemic uh, those things will become those will emerge as the optimizations 
as as things go along. So one thing that for sure I think will uh, will reinforce this is the the complementary achievement of net zero. So that transition um, produces a lot of stresses that I think will will encourage the circular economy. But I wouldn't necessarily connect it to the pandemic. It's the the premise of the question. That's uh, yeah. I, I I think I think it would have happened without the pandemic. Is what I'm really trying to say. Yeah. Okay. A uh, question from Marvin. Stephen, how do you see the international higher education sector evolving in the post-pandemic period, given the online education experience since the pandemic? Um, I'm going to, it has a couple of points to this question. Okay. Uh, what are the implications for Canada and new competitors emerging in Asia and beyond? And what does it mean for the innovation agenda in Canada and in China and other evolving markets? Well, that's a, that's a really deep and uh, penetrating question. What's, what's the next question? Okay. Oh, I'm just kidding. I know. So, so uh, no, uh, but, it, but I mean, I, I'll just say a few words about it. I don't have a, a complete answer for that. I mean, I th I've always been excited by the higher education sector as a major exporter. I think, I think it's uh, got all kinds of potential and Canada's got a fabulous brand out there. So we can definitely compete. And you have to believe that this thing about going virtual has opened more doors than it has closed. Um, you know, and I, my sense is that uh, our universities, the ones I've been on their platforms, have been doing it very well. Um, and of course, what the future will look like is more of a blended, a blended uh, provision of, of their services. Um, that they're out in front of that. And so, and then that brand, I think, um, is, is a very uh, attractive one internationally. But I think one of the, one of the, the big attractions for Canada's uh, post-secondary education system is the Can Canadian experience and how it can, being here can also lead to good jobs. And, you know, a, a, you know it's on, it works for both the, the student and for Canada, because I mentioned before the shortage of workers and what better way to get someone to understand you know, what it's like to live and work here uh, than to have them go to school here. And then they become these really prime candidates uh, for, for immigration. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the, the e-learning doesn't disrupt that. That's become a solid supply chain of workers uh, for Canada through the universities. And I'm hopeful, of course, that we all get vaccinated so that that can go back to a more normal delivery. Um, anyway, as for competition, I'm, I'm not I don't, I'm not very knowledgeable all about that. I just know that that Canada is, you know, among the best in this uh, in this sense. You would think, though, that uh, growth of e-learning will make that competition more intense. I would certainly agree with that. If you can, I mean, if you can tap into Harvard from from the privacy of your basement you know, more people will do it, do this, I suppose. So that, that's, that's where the competition might, might come from. Yeah, and we're seeing that at fit with our post-secondary educational partners, a lot of the uh, blended version of education and yeah. uh, a lot more um, people studying from home and not necessarily coming into Canada. Right, right. Uh, so question um, from Mike, um, what do you think if there'd be more onshoring moving from offshoring sourcing for production where it's business as same sorry I think I'm gonna have to move on from that question Sheena and maybe you can re redo that one um Giovain, sorry thank you based on the trade is between people what is that's the quote we were talking about earlier <laughs> what yeah. what is the Canadian relationship matrix now what are the top five countries Canadian companies should look for and uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, well, and thank you very much for the hardest question so far. Uh, but, but, you know, I mean, look, uh, I, I don't really think that, uh, that the, the landscape has changed. What I, what I think of it is, as we've got this overlay of risk that, that can, it doesn't shut things off, but can kind of nudge it or interfere with it at the edges. So I rather think of it as some risks that need to mean more active management. We can't just assume everything will be fine uh, if, we're, if we're exposed to China. 
of course, yeah, we're all exposed in some way to China. So we need to nurture those relationships, both as governments and as individuals. And I think that was true before. It wasn't easy before, and I don't think it's easy now. Um, has it tilted a little bit? Yes, maybe. And so, uh, and so of course, uh, it makes sense to lean on developing relationships more in countries where we have some extra protections with our, with our trade agreements. And uh, those are the obvious candidates. Uh, but uh, you know they're not they're not the only ones. Yeah, I, I don't really have a. I know I'm, I'm a little bit equivocating because I don't have a very concrete answer to that question. I don't think the world has changed as much as it, it seems. You know, to to read the headlines. Yeah. Uh, question uh, from Jan Tinder: What is stopping Canadian companies from trading with countries other than the U.S. Yeah. Though they have been talking about this for for many decades. Many decades, my many. whole life, my whole life, and longer. Yes. Uh, you know, but you know, look at look, this is this is the thing. Um, if you were going to start from scratch, how would you how would you want to develop this? I mean, economists who study trade uh, have in their models, uh, you know, prices and you know, exchange rates and all that, and the most important variable is proximity. And the second most important variable is size. So here's Canada, this little thing compared to everybody else with this gigantic dynamic, the most dynamic, the most productive, the most everything economy on earth. Who would you rather have as a trading partner? Okay, imagine the solar system with all the planets in it. And there's people living on all the planets. Where would all the international trade, interplanetary trade happen? It would happen between the big ones. You know, Jupiter and Saturn would trade like mad with each other. And, uh, and planet Earth would be sitting there wishing somebody would phone them. Okay. So we're so lucky. Uh, you know, and when you think about it, all it took was, you know, building the Trans-Canada Railway and, you know, when the U.S. canceled the reciprocity agreement, which is our first free trade agreement with the United States, right after the Civil War, uh, you know, Canada went went nuts. There was they had no there, that wasn't going to work at all. So they, Confederation was the result. We'll trade with each other instead of with those nasty those nasty folks that just cut us off. And and so we built this country, and then we managed to, tr to trade with them too. Of course we did. That's the law of gravity. It just is. And so we shouldn't lament it. We should pray. We should be excited by it and exploit it as much as we can, build even stronger linkages and not worry about being disproportionately weighted. That's the most diverse economy on earth. So you're already diversified. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, anyway, I, I, I'm overreacting because I think, of course, you should always develop other trade relationships too. But the fact that they remain small as part of the total, that doesn't make them unvaluable. It makes them extremely valuable, but, but it doesn't mean that we should try, somehow try to reduce how much trade we do with the United States. Yeah, good point. Um, so I've just been, uh, I just uh, lost track of time. Oops. And, and uh, it's time to wrap up. So that was the last question. Uh, however, there are a number of questions that we haven't been able to get to. So uh, for our audience, I'd just like to say that uh, we will try to uh, get to these questions in uh, our articles on the Trade uh, Ready blog. And um, so if I'll just uh, wrap up, I want to thank Steve very much uh, for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to see you and uh, listen to you. Uh, I, I think we could have gone on for quite a lot longer, especially with all those questions. Uh, Alberto, thank you very much. And uh, a special thanks to our audience as well. It's been a great event, uh, so topical and uh, obviously very pertinent to the international trade community. Uh, we do have some resources that you can refer to. The links have been added to the uh, event chat area. Uh, if you want to pre-order Stephen's book, uh, his new book, The Next Age of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future, you can click on the link that has already been shared in the chat comments section. Uh, that's from uh, Penguin Random House. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
um, understand a couple other resources uh, to understand globalization, international markets, supply chains, and international business with the fit uh, with the online fit skills course global value chain that has been uh, linked for you or take the fit skills international distribution uh, workshop. And uh, if you're not already a certified uh, member, a certified um, CITP professional, if you do not already have a CITP professional designation, and if you're working in international trade and that is your calling, uh, make the CITP designation your path to international trade success. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you to our audience. Very much appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very Thanks. much. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.